You are listening to Level Up Your Gaming Podcast, episode 124, Choosing the Right System for Your Game. In today's episode, we discuss different systems and choosing the right one for your game. We discuss what several different systems have and their settings for their games. We also discuss their tailored mechanics that can make for a smoother experience for a specific game. Bandit Camp has launched a hardcover print run Kickstarter for both Wicked Ones and its full expansion game, Undead Awakening. In Wicked Ones, you play as monsters building a dungeon together and slaying adventurers. It's heavily inspired by the PC game Dungeon Keeper. In Undead Awakening, you play as a group of powerful undead leading hordes against the living and playing through classic undead horror movie moments. They're forged in the dark games and hit themes that you don't usually see covered much, such as playing the bad guys. They also have a ton of awesome art by Victor Costa. Links will be in the show notes for Bandit Camp, their Kickstarter, and the Wicked Ones free edition on DriveThruRPG. Check them out. If you'd like to participate in the discussion or leave us feedback, you can contact us at levelupyourgamingpodcast at gmail.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash levelupyourgaming. If you like the content and want to hear more of the show, subscribe and we'll ensure you don't miss an episode. New episodes come out almost every Wednesday. Also, please review, tell a friend about the podcast, or share with your gaming group. Now sit back and enjoy the episode. Bow, 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 bow. Level up your gaming podcast. Welcome to the Level Up Your Gaming Podcast. My name is Aaron, and joining me in person once again, Tom. Hello. Hey, Tom. How are you doing today? I'm doing glorious. After a couple audio hiccups here, we're finally underway. <laughs> Technology, it's so hard. Uh, yeah, thank, thank God I have uh, multiple ways to record this podcast. Otherwise, you know, I hit the end of this episode and I'd be like, why is this happening? Fun fact, smoke signal, not the best way. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, I'm glad to have you back joining me here. Before we get into the episode, I'm going to give some updates for the podcast. Um, so we are working on uh, a live play collaboration with uh, with some other podcasting groups. So more news to come from that. Uh, I'll let you know that in a, in a week. Um we are also uh, you'll you'll hear a spot for a coming game or, or a game that just launched on Kickstarter, um, and so keep an eye out for that. Uh, go check them out. And uh, at the moment, that's uh, that's all we got. More more news to come soon, but uh, we'll get on with the episode here. So uh, today, Tom and I are going to talk about choosing the right system for your game. This is actually an ep- a topic that you brought up to me. Yeah, I, I I think it's an important topic because a lot of people kind of get very focused, and while that's good sometimes, it's not always a good. Thing. Yeah, yeah, no, I I think again, I almost exclusively play World of Darkness, and I, I, we're we're going to talk about it a little bit here uh, in terms of like what are kind of the benefits of some systems versus versus others, but in a lot of ways, we have sort of mastered that system, and so we've sort of bended it. To our will um but i think that when you start looking at different game systems that are out there and uh this will be a little payoff for you gary we're finally going to talk a little bit about the fate system and i'll dive into it deeper in a, in a future episode um because i actually started looking up on it and now i understand why you asked me to take a look at it it does <laughs> make sense <laughs> it, it, it makes sense for a lot of the things that jared and i had talked about on this podcast but also um you know different systems do fit different stories better and this is you know maybe a case for choosing the right system for your game um if you want to go back and listen to the episode that uh that our listener chris did where he he uh, sent us in a recording about how to run the cortex prime system uh it's a very flexible system uh and in this case you know what are what do some other systems have to offer so I'll, i'll start with the fate system here and the fate system you know it from what i've read so far is it's it's quick to start up very collaborative in that nature it's very narrative driven and the uh the setting is is fairly agnostic and it's an easy dice system so it's very light on the role-playing things a lot of just say yes uh that we've talked about and you know just assume that your narrative is going to work um actually after reading it i I realized that the the hybrid game system that i played in the one time uh, was very similar, or it seems like a lot of things were kind of cannibalized out of that to make that system. It's very, it's very identical in a lot of nature uh, that that it has. Um, but there's also like the World of Darkness system that you and I are both very familiar with. 
for your angsty teenagers. For your angsty teenagers. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the things I think that the world of darkness system has is there's a lot of lethality involved in it, and it's a big horror setting for it. Um, uh, you, you mentioned that it's it's got a, a very interesting power scale associated to it. Yeah, the when you start off as like a whelp or as like a, a fledgling or whatnot, like you can do some stuff, and that stuff's actually really cool what you can do. And then you see what the next level can do, and it's like, wow, that's pretty good. And then what the next level can do, and so on and so forth. And then you just see like your boss effectively, who's just like, I can like crush you if I wanted to without batting an eye. It's very, um, it's very oppressing, but it's also very exciting at the same time. It's, you, you get to see that that threat difference. I think it's very evident also in like the vampire world, uh, especially as like you go into the it, you. One of the things that, that you probably don't grasp from the vampire setting is that how how intense the power scale ramps up and like when you start getting to like the the older generation vampires the best movie that sort of ever did kind of the vampire setting was sort of the underworld movies they <laughs> they kind of mimicked a little bit of that they really had a a big thing for the vampires and they hated the werewolves but they had a big thing for the vampires and uh you can kind of see the more of the kind of dynamics of the the, the power setting in that oh absolutely like they were all terrified about the elder vampires in the underworld movies yes. and like every time you saw a new one like in every movie it's like this is the main villain because everyone will have to work together because this guy can murk you um it was very exciting and, and those villains were very like not just showy but very like you could you could feel their presence and the vampires like the main character came Beckinsale like she could do some really cool things and you'd see her do really cool things against those poor poor defenseless werewolves uh, but then you'd see her boss and it's like oh my god <laughs> like how does she stand a chance <laughs> exactly I mean it, it, it's it's that but that is very akin to the world of darkness settings uh, in, in, in the power scale and the power creep there um, the other one is the d d setting obviously that you and I played in and uh, and if you want a fantasy setting, D and D is, you know, the best one of the best ways to go. I think. Yeah, it's a very good system for a couple of things. A, because it's such a common system, you can get a really good feel for what you're getting into. It's you know, it's very much the Lord of the Rings kind of persona. Like, okay, I'm going for this heroic journey, and then like as you grow, you feel very defined growth points. When you gain a level in 7C, you get so much more stuff for you to, like, be able to do and, and like, grow towards that you feel great when you make those levels. It's kind of that addiction of, like, I, got, I just need another fix. I just need to get that extra level, and then I'm going to get that extra feat, man, and it's just great. Yes, exactly. Because you're like you're like man. Once I get that feat, then I can do this in combat, and I can. And then when my when I when I get flanks going along with me, there I have advantage all the time. Like this will be the greatest thing ever since sliced bread. Or when you're playing like a wizard and you start getting more and more spells, I realize just it's just gonna be fireball or some variant thereof. <laughs> Good old fireball. Nothing oh. beats fireball. <laughs> Nothing beats fireball. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's why they had to make so many things not like you know, resistant to fire because. Well, was, but that's okay. There's a feat for that. <laughs> There's a feat for that. Also, just throw more fireball. Yeah. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. More fireball. <laughs> um, it also has that very RPG feel. Like if you put together the classes, you kind of get that kind of classic RPG feel and vibe uh, to the combat. And uh, the combat itself is very tactical in nature i think that's just like part of what D and where it came from i kind of brought it in from like you know you, you i think you mentioned it if you have a bunch of war gamers this is the probably the, the easiest transition you could do like a hundred percent easiest transition it's like wait okay so we have miniatures and we have a, a game board and we're basically trying to outmaneuver our threats so we can take it over okay so this is just like a very small scale warhammer oh, oh okay oh, I, I got this so now you know it's just individuals all right so it's like more time yes it's like more time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Um, and then we, uh, we, we, we played Seventh Sea together. Um, and Seventh Sea is more of a pulpy, kind of campy style stories. Um, you know, it, what, Zorro would be a good example of it, Pirates of the Caribbean, things like that. Yeah, it, it's... It's light fantasy, so you can still get that magic if you want it. It's not going to be nearly as powerful as, like, D&D, but it'll be fun, campy, happy-go-lucky. When you lose, you don't really lose, because you're the heroes in the movie, and that doesn't happen to them. They may get that scar over their eye or, or like, that dramatic injury that, for some reason, just makes them look even more suave, uh, but, but that's pretty much what's going to happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think everything that... It, what is it? Nobody actually dies in the game. The only way you can kill a, a villain, and like it pretty much works the same way, is A, certain things will call it out, and you're almost required to. They even have blurbs about it in the storyteller guide and before each monster that could kill you. Is you have to have an NPC there to be killed to show that the monster can kill. Like you did with the, uh, the Basilisk, right? <laughs> yeah, like I did with the Basilisk. It's like, this can happen now. And then outside of those moments, like you beat up a villain, you could shoot him with a cannon if you wanted to, and he'll just be in front of you on the ground, almost limp, barely breathing, but he won't die. Not at all, unless if you actively force it because you're heroes. And villains will do the same thing. They'll, they'll beat you within an inch of your life, but you could fall off like the highest skyscraper, and if you fall in a thing of water, because there will be a thing of water at the bottom, you're safe. You didn't die. <laughs> Again, it's, it's, a, it's that, just that very, uh, it, your, your, your entire story when we played it was more Indiana Jones. Yeah, it, it works very well for Three Musketeers, style stories, Indiana Jones, Zorro, you know, any kind of thing where you want to have those bah, 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 bah kind of moments. Um, and then another system that you've played that I haven't is Mutants and Masterminds. And so maybe you can tell me a little bit what about makes that a good choice. So Mutants and Masterminds is a fairly flexible uh, system. You still have, like, a level growth like you do in uh, D&D or some of the other ones we'll mention. Um, but it's all just a percentile basis. I mean, you literally only need two dice to play the game uh, and, and your character sheet. That could be kind of useful. Um, but because you craft how your powers work using their confines, you can adapt it to a number of different um, environments. It does have some power scaling to it, but unless if you design threats to be radically outside your power scaling, it's not going to feel dramatically like oppressive like a, a world of darkness would. Or like a D&D &D if your threat level is just a, a little bit too far for your characters and you get party wipes. Um, so it can be used for both futuristic, past, present. It's, it's pretty decent at a lot of different environments, just as long as you have wonkiness like it's not going to do very well for more of like a a more real world as mm. opposed to a very like over the top kind of world that makes sense um and then to kind of go along with that percentile dice side of things there's also call of cthulhu which is all percentile dice mm -hmm. based uh that's another horror game but it's got very low success yeah. uh the mortality you mortality <laughs> the mortality is very high there i mean that's sort of the the, uh, the the setting and the feel of the game is to have that mortality. You know, you, you struggle against, you know, the old ones and you never quite get there. <laughs> uh, it's, it's always very ambiguous monsters. I, th I remember reading a story section about, like, how do you handle... Cause I played in a couple of them. I said, how do you handle, like, your big monsters? How do you determine how many health levels they have? All this other stuff. And basically, the, the best thing I got from it was there is no monster manual. It's just create your monster and have them wail on it until you feel like it's about time to let them have the win. <laughs> I may have done that a number of times for monsters anyway. <laughs> uh, but again, your players don't know the difference, and in the Call of Cthulhu game it's kind of ambiguous. The monsters are very you know, these monstrosities that you have not, no idea about. Like, No, no. They're always I mean, otherworldly things that will destroy you. It's, it's fantastic if you want to get depressed. Or, or you have to have some sort of gimmick to kill them or something like that. Um, and then there's the Shadowrun games, which is, I guess, D&D-like. It, it, it has a lot of the different races like D&D, &D, but it's set in, like, a futuristic cyberpunk kind of feel. 
I don't bend as much towards the like other races portion if I play that, but it is a, a decent setting if you want to have like a, a a cyberpunk universe. Even if you don't use the system, it's fantastic research material if you want to use that setting um, because it's been around for a while, so it's got a lot of content. Uh, another good source if you want to do. Uh, cyberpunk, it's actually not even role-playing game, or at least I don't think they ever made one for it, is uh, Netrunner. They had a card game for it, and a board game for it, and a lot of books about it, but it, it's another great like cyberpunk kind of feel set. Okay, and then uh, the only other one that I know that you've played that I have not is Anima. Yeah, that's a smaller one. Uh, given the name, you'll be shocked to find out that there is some anime style to it. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be, to be honest. It, it's kind of like a dark D&D. Like, where D&D, you're going on those heroic adventures, it it brings more real world. Like, the, the realms that you're in in this fantasy very much tie to real world er- areas, just more tropish versions of them. So, like, the samurai can tap into mysticism in Japan and and you know the the military of England is very oppressive and taking over the world kind of business, um, but that one ended up having some really good content for one story that I ran, and we'll probably get into that one uh, later. Um, but but the the big point of it is there's a ton of systems out. There. Yeah, yeah, we we just rattle off like eight or nine of them here right now, and you know you're right. There there are a ton of systems now. A lot of them are like in terms of their construction. Mm-hmm. So, like, Pathfinder, uh, you know, Star Wars, D&D, they all sort of have similar backgrounds and the 20-sided dice, how you roll and how you make, how you work out your skills and stuff. Um, but I think the, the the thing is, you know, why why dig into a different system? Like, I'm, I'm a, a World of Darkness player or you're listening, you're a D&D player. Why would you even bother digging in to a different system? Well, first off, there, there's nothing forcing you to. If you're having a, a blast running your current game arcs and your characters are really enjoying it, have at it. Have you know, keep on going that to your heart's content. However, sometimes the game you want to run may not necessarily flush out well with the system that you're using. And so you really got two options. You can try to bend your system to your will, like Sauron with the Nine Rings, or you can maybe look around for another system. Now, I'm going to let you know there's a couple of really strong benefits and disadvantages to doing a new system. Is You are a master of World of Darkness, Aaron. Like, you've been playing World of Darkness for longer than many people have been alive, you <laughs> old man. Uh, but because of that... Sometimes a person can get very focused on, like, this is the method of playing. Like, a number of DD players couldn't imagine life without uh, hit points and life without levels and, yes. <laughs> and whatnot. Or, like, a World of Darkness player may not be able to have as cheery of a game, you know, something very lighthearted. It just, it, it, it doesn't mesh well with the system. I mean, heck, even look at, can, or not, Changeling, that's right. Changeling from that system. Yeah. They, they made fairies dark. <laughs> like, Every it, it is the world of darkness. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it, it's just some systems aren't going to work that well for what you're trying to convey. So if you have a story in your mind that you're like, I want to run this story, develop that story. Like, develop what you want your characters to go through. Some of the ordeals they should go through. Like, some of the core values of your system. And then see if you can find some good content to work from. It doesn't always have to be a movie or video game. Um, It could very well be a new system. Like, I wanted to run a story about um, the seven deadly sins kind of thing. I wanted my character, or I wanted the players to kind of have have to fight against it, but kind of take on the the sins themselves in order to beat them against this, you know, super oppressive threat. So I looked around, um, and that's the only reason I came across the Anima system is it had uh, a story about uh, like uh, thirty coins that were given in exchange for betraying like uh, uh, Jesus or whatever in that game's equivalent. Um, 
And so I, I kind of grabbed that as an idea. I'm like, wait, yeah, this is kind of cool, you know? Like, it's something that you don't really, really see a lot of, but it represents just, like, not a good thing, probably. We can all agree. <laughs> so, it, so it's like, I could have those be the sins. I mean, sure, Seven Deadly Sins is iconic. Mm. Why not 30? And then just break out the seven to be, like, 30 different kind of evil, super bad things. And and I built an entire world around that. And actually, some of the other people who have been on the show, like uh, Ken Spensley, he, he actually... Uh, um, played in one of those so it, he really enjoyed it or at least I believe he did hopefully he did <laughs> but, but anywho um, it, it can help you flush out your world and it can give you some direction the other cool perk about maybe switching your system is it keeps your players on their toes a little bit sometimes they can get so entrenched on this is how the system works which is nice it's a very even playing field but you do kind of get set in your ways sometimes and so kicking some dust into them and getting them to try and break out of that mold may be just the thing you need to get them to realize role-playing doesn't have to be what they're currently doing. Um, now, obviously, if you go too different, it, it may fail miserably. And honestly, switching to a new system, if you're not comfortable with it, may fail miserably so you have to work with your players if you're gonna do this you don't do it to spite them um, but it is a good way to maybe reinvent things and get yourself inspired about uh, what it is you're running because a it's about a story you care about and you just found a system to tell your story as i you know have done this podcast for you know well nearing three years now um you know the thing that I, I, as I interact with some different listeners, is that I find that the setting in D and D can be restrictive. Um, I would say restrictive, but more challenging um, to being, you know, a social game or to doing like a horror setting within the game. And I think that is by dint of how the combat is designed within the game. And so, you know, that's one of the things that when you're looking to tell. Uh, you know, different types of stories. That's where the different, uh, for me at least, that's when you start looking at the different systems and going, this system may tell this type of story better because the setting is more geared around, well, you know, you could die at any moment. And, you know, this is, you know, the, the monsters are very ambiguous. Or, uh, you know, if I want to tell something more high fantasy, uh, well, Call of Cthulhu isn't going to really mesh up to that okay because in high fantasy your heroes tend to live on your heroes tend to be able to fight through great challenges and in call of cthulhu i mean people die like left and right okay like a stiff wind could kill your character yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and fun fact even sticking within D and D's walls um there's a bunch of different realms that or, granted i played a lot of a D and D way back in the day way back in the day um and they have different realms, too. It's not just Forgotten Realms, but they had Dragonlands, Ravenloft, Dark Suns. Dark Suns, by the way, when you first made your character, you were supposed to make multiple of them because it was expected that one would die at least. <laughs> so you needed a backup character. That Okay, that's a good sign for mortality. I mean, it's no Call of Cthulhu. That game is... Well, you die. In AD and D, <laughs> everything that I know is that it is a much, much more mortal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There was very much of a yeah. You got to zero hit points. Guess what? Guess what happened? <laughs> Wait, you mean there's no, there's no fourteen death saving throws and yeah. no wiggling your way out of this one unless you got that wish? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I I think that that's one of the reasons why you do look to new games, mm -hmm. and then you know I, I think that other other reasons to look to other games and I, I would i would tend to look towards ones that would probably be easier to execute okay so when i when i looked at it here in the fate system uh just recently before like earlier today before we started doing this episode i looked at the kind of the simplicity behind one the rolling system in it and then the narrative aspect to it and then two that you can sort of fit it into it, it's designed to be fit into most settings uh, a la like GURPS or something like that. GURPS, but much less crunchy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, but it, it, you, you can sort of do whatever you want with it and tell the type of story that you want to tell. 
Um, I don't know how the combat necessarily plays out. I don't know. I haven't seen the flow for that. And that's always going to be part of, I think, any game is that there's going to be some combat in there. And even if you're like a heavy intrigue political game, highly recommend you throw in some fights where your players get to punch some people. And that it, it's, it's, it, it's a good way to, to give yourself time. And it's a good way to, uh, to get your players to kind of blow off some steam so they don't do something stupid and ruin your game. So, <laughs> but, uh, the the design of the system is very simple and very narrative focused and like i would say even in the 7c game very simple very narrative fo focused there are a lot of dice though in the 7c game as a whole oh uh, yeah and the, the system is far more complex based off what I, I i only have a tertiary understanding of fate but it's a far more complex system as well the, the plus side of it is it's a yes and system, which honestly, fate looks to be very much improv -y, like yes and as well. well yeah, um, it's, it's, so. it's very collaborative with you, the GM, and, the, and the, the players, and the players kind of figure out a lot of things about how they know each other and stuff like that. So it, it, it makes things, you know, it, it is actually the, the, when I looked at the system, it was one of the first systems that had the built-in session zero. Like it is a built-in session zero. Mm -hmm. It's it's designed for starting up that game in that way. Uh, and we, we talk about the session zero as being an important thing to have. And I would highly suggest if you've never done one before, do a session zero. It helps get your games going in the right direction from the start. <laughs> yeah, not all games have to start with a bar fight, and you all happen to agree with each other once you meet <laughs> or some other ridiculous combo. Don't, don't, don't play the guessing game, and don't try to assume that your players are going to like the game that you're, that you're playing in. Come to some understanding and agreement, and also you don't want the person playing like, like okay, so we're all, we're all going to play you know, in this fantasy setting. Yes, yes, and Jim over here is playing the fish man who cannot live or walk on land. <laughs> like, like uh, great. Uh, <laughs> why, why did you choose that character, Jim? Well, you didn't say we couldn't play the fish. Man. You didn't say it was going to be over a mountain. <laughs> why didn't you tell me? You didn't say there was going to be this epic land journey. <laughs> okay, again, you don't want somebody to make the Kender character as, as, as Jared often talked about in the previous episodes and you don't want somebody to you just you want everybody to move in the right direction yeah that's why you would go with the session zero but well, they're I, more likely to have fun if they're all kind of on the same page yes I, I i would i would argue that if your success rate with games is a 60 percent without a session zero you're probably going higher into the 80 percent with yeah. a session zero <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it just makes things run a lot smoother um, but I, but I digress. Or I'm moving off off the topic here. So again, this is you know why why you choose the the new game system would be to try and tell the setting for your game uh, in a more optimal way. Choosing a system that would better help convey the storytelling that you want to do uh, in the system. But I mean, on the other side of things here, and this is sort of genre meshing the the, the topic here, is looking. Every system is worthwhile to look at in terms of storytelling aspects and how to execute story. If you if you say D and D is my game, learning how Seven C does different aspects of their story, learning how Anima would do different aspects of their story, learning how World of Darkness would do different aspects of their story, Fate, so on and so forth, that helps gives you this uh, this toolbox and ammunition, which is sort of what the podcast always has been. You know, Jared always said he would go straight to the storytelling section in every book. He doesn't care about the system. He wants to know how they storytell, how mm -hmm. they build and construct their stories. And I, I, I would say that, you know, you can get that from every system. And, you know, can you genre mesh and can you pull some of these systems in? Sort of, yes, but you better be, you know, pretty thoughtful in how you, you pull the, uh, the systems in. Yeah, I'm not going to say you can't genre mesh by mixing up systems. I'm going to say that they were probably written with some amount of playtesting involved. <laughs> and so the, it's not that you're going to come up with something that they never did. Like, that very well could happen. Um, but there's a lot of room for failure if you're starting to, like, pull too much from other systems into one. It's, you know. But you can find in a system 
how they handle something and implement how they handle it in tiers like D and D. If it's if it, if you're having problems running social settings because it's hard for you to really represent the skills. I mean, it's just one role. Did I succeed? Great. Then I find all this stuff. <laughs> um, then you may find that another system could have the answer you're looking for. And even if not, I know you switched or Jared would switch over to the storyteller uh, portion of every other system. I switch over to the uh, story composite and for the, the fluff um, for each of the different settings, because so often it's going to give me that inspiration to really help me drive home or f more fully develop a story I wanted to run. And odds are they haven't read all those random system settings. And so you can really sneak some things on people and get yourself some inspiration and tell a, a more full story with less work. <laughs> Yeah, you can probably cannibalize some stories out of different. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> uh, because I mean, yeah, the, you you are correct. the The likelihood that your players outside of the systems that you play have ever played one of these <laughs> other systems probably very low, unless like you're doing the online gaming thing, you've got more access to other players to mm -hmm. be able to try different systems. And that's a good way of, of finding those kind of people. There's a lot of Reddit communities and and whatnot that yes. uh, will share and love sharing uh, all these different other systems that you haven't ever heard of and your your table also has never heard of this is a good way also for you if you want to tell a story you're like you know i think the system fits the right type of story i want to tell for my table uh you've gotten kind of buy-in for your from your players it's a good way to go learn the system is to go play in it under somebody else see how it's done uh or you could i mean if you're so bold pilot your own game <laughs> for some people uh, and see I how see it you goes. like to live dangerously. See you like to live dangerously. I also <laughs> like to live dangerously. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the online community is also a great way to do a lot of that preliminary research for you on the cheap. Yes. Uh, so you don't have to like delve over lots of books and spend a lot of time and or money like getting all this content and realizing I didn't actually want any of this. <laughs> yeah, the nice thing about some of the uh, the systems that we mentioned here, especially in like the Fate and even Call of Cthulhu is they have online primers for like, just like get started, play the system. Uh, like they just like condensed versions of the game, which is really nice in terms of being able to just try the system without having to invest in all of the, the hardware behind the scenes to, to run the system. Even if you're doing like online PDFs and stuff uh, from like drive through RPG, it's still extremely, uh, you know, it, it, it can be very expensive to go buy like a bunch of source books and different material. And really all you want to do is get an idea on you know how does this thing work so <laughs> but um no the the other thing that I, I i wanted to mention with this too is that the more that i have looked into newer systems that have been coming out and sort of the evolution of systems and uh i, I talked to jared about this too and i found it interesting when i read about the fate system is that the newer systems tend to be very uh light on the the rolling aspects of the game uh, to try to almost eliminate that unless absolutely necessary within the game itself. And to go more into the narrative focused kind of heavy storytelling stuff. Jared apparently found a system that he's very uh, interested in storytelling for us. And so after his current game and after uh, whoever story tells next, he has a story built on this new system for like a one shot just to just to try something different which is gonna be really weird it's gonna be like whoa we're doing something different it may ruin your friendship you it might just... <laughs> it might ruin our friendship exactly he wanted to do blades of the dark but he didn't like how uh how the dice calculations worked out in blades of the dark he loved everything else about it but he's like he's like man figuring out how to like roll dice in blades of the dark was like calculus i don't know if that's true anybody want to refute that Right in level for gaming podcast at gmail.com. Let me know how wrong I am about that. <laughs> but that he, he he always talked about how that was a, a, a real challenge. But again, the, the the stories that you have here can, can fit your game. Like you want to tell a superhero story, the best one of the best systems for that is going to be uh, you got Heroes Unlimited or you got uh, you can do Aberrant. I love Aberrant. Aberrant's a great game if you want to tell superhero stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, there's so there's so many good options that you have there, and so many games are built around 
the different settings as a whole. So, you know, really try to embrace what is maybe already out there to, to tell in your setting. And then after you've story told it or after you've played in the game, you know, if you, if you like it, story tell it. If you don't like it and you've conceptualized how you could adapt that into D&D or World of Darkness, you can then have a better idea of how that played and how it could look like playing it in front of your players as well. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but no, that's uh, that's really all I've got to say on this. You have any other any other thoughts there, Tom? Yeah, no, I, I think this is a, a pretty good one. I I will say it's a lot of your own research and finding things out and having some fun with it. Is uh, you know, explore the story you want to run and then use that as baseline and uh, find a system that works for you. And more often than not, you're going to be more excited after you read some of the content around the story you already wanted to run, but now you found out that there's stuff to work with so you don't have to do everything yourself. The legwork can be brutal uh, when, when creating a new story. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, as, as we previously talked and you, how you draw inspiration for different stories, <laughs> what's uh, around you. Um, and again, you know, th that's just... It's part of being a GM. It's yeah. just, that's that's just, just how it works. That's how it works. Um, but anyways, that's going to go ahead and wrap us up here uh, for the episode. So uh, if you've got any thoughts on systems that you like to run, different systems that you've tried, uh, how you like to approach new systems, uh, level up your gaming podcast at gmail.com or facebook.com slash level up your gaming. Uh, I'm also on YouTube. The podcast is on YouTube. So go ahead and smash that like button or follow us there. Um, and, you know, go ahead and review the podcast, subscribe, uh, all that other good stuff recommended to a friend. Uh, I just got an email that I'm not, I wasn't at Gen Con, which I think is starting like tomorrow. So, <laughs> oh man, I used to go to Gen Con all the time. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm not at Gen Con. Sorry about that guys. Uh, uh, oh, I'm recording this a week in advance. So that's going to totally make no sense to anybody who's listening to this, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that's going to wrap us up for the week. So, uh, for Tom. I'm Aaron. Have a great week, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye now. Bye bye. <laughs> do 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 do. <laughs> Gaming podcast. Level it up. <laughs> <laughs>